All right, everyone. So today we have an extremely special guest on the show and on the channel. We have Sam Ghosh, who is currently an associate on the sustainable investing team at CPP Investments. Before his current role, he began his career as an investment banking analyst. And from there, he spent four and a half years in management consulting at Oliver Wyman, where he was also a founding member of Oliver Wyman's forum's Climate and Sustainability Initiative. In 2019, he was also selected to participate in Rockefeller Foundation's fellowship, and he also studied at the Smith School of Business at Queen's University, where I'm currently at, and which we all know is the best business school in Canada, hands down. So as you can see, he has quite the unique background, experiences, and exposure to business and the financial markets. So Sam, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. Uh, did I miss any of your incredible accomplishments? Uh, no, you, no, you did. It's uh, it's flattering. Um, great, great to meet you. Great to be on. Um, to clarify, I know the the name is hard to pronounce with S O M, but pretend there's an H in there and pretend there's an E and E at the end, and and it's pronounced Shom. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, uh, you're you're spot on on the the background and the work experiences. It's it's great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I guess one other cool accomplishment I discovered while doing a bit of research is that you and your friends were somewhat of heroes for your high school grad class and community. Um, as I, I found out that, you know, as part of the British Columbia Automobile Association annual dry grad video challenge, you guys created a video highlighting the risks of driving under the influence, influence which was really impactful. So I guess this kind of foreshadowed your eventual career in working in environment, the environmental and sustainability side of business and finance. So I, I guess my question to you is, did you always know that you wanted to pursue a career in bettering sustainability? And how did you come to that decision? Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised you found that video. Uh, you got to see if I could take that off the internet uh, at one point. But um, to, to give you that, like, thousand foot view on on where where i am today i i think um i will be cliche a bit in terms of i am from vancouver born and raised on the west coast um i feel like to different degrees everyone from here likes the environment and wants to help the environment um it's green here i love camping hiking um and all the such uh experiences you would you would think about in vancouver so very cliche um, very typical Vancouver. So I always knew I wanted to be a part of that side, like helping the environment, um, bettering the environment. And climate change was a more of an uh, uh, up and coming topic at that time. Um, but I knew I kind of wanted to be a part of it. I just didn't know how. Um, fast forward, uh, probably about 15 to 20 years uh, from there, um, after graduating from Queens, I thought uh, maybe investment banking would be good, consulting would be good. Cliche about Queens as well is there's everyone thinks there's only four career paths, which are uh, uh, consulting, finance, accounting, and marketing. Uh, very much isn't true, but I, I did fall into that mold of thinking there was. And I thought out of those, uh, I thought banking and consulting would be a good fit to my skill set. I, I had a lot of friends going there. So I thought, why not give it a shot? Did consulting and um, then worked at the Rockefeller Foundation. And I always had this in the back of my mind being from Vancouver. Climate change and the environment is an area that I want to help better uh, across the world. But it wasn't until my time at the Rockefeller Foundation, working and living in Thailand, where I, it was kind of a aha moment where it wasn't just the impact we're having on climate change and the world, it's the outsized impact of climate change on the most vulnerable. So those that have contributed the least to climate change are actually going to be suffering the most. It's the farmer in Thailand uh, when I was there that was experiencing a drought. Um, he lived in a very small um, um, house in Thailand uh, no laundry machine, no uh, convention engine uh, vehicle, uh, but was suffering because of the drought that was affecting him at that time. I'm thinking back at my time in North America. I have laundry machines, uh, cars, uh, full closet of clothes, 
thinking, wow, this was actually me who helped contribute to that, that, um, that impact for him. So it was an aha moment where it wasn't just protecting the environment. It was protecting the most vulnerable. Um, and hence what, uh, what got me to focus my career, both in consulting and now in financial services in, uh, in climate change. Um, so hopefully that was like a really short, um, but probably longer than, uh, than maybe you envisioned on uh, my career path to, to climate change and the environment. Uh, no, for sure. That, that was definitely great. And I want to touch on a few of those points um, a little bit later as well. And I guess one thing I was really curious about is definitely, you know, you were mentioning that figuring out what you wanted to do, whether that was, you know, consulting, investment banking. And I'm sure a lot of people, including myself, we find ourselves wondering what we wanted to do. And, you know, in your third year summer, you were an investment banking analyst at Green Tech Capital Advisors. Uh, which you know specializes in, in helping sustainable technology and infrastructure businesses. Now, what made you decide to join that firm? I mean, I'm curious as to what investment banking even looks like at such a niche firm versus, let's say, some of those bigger banks, which maybe are more specialized in, let's say, the technology side of things, or they maybe just focus specifically on M&A. So what was that decision behind that joining that bank? And what did it look like? Yeah, definitely. Um, I learned about Green Tech actually in my first year. Um, I was a part of QFAC and the co-chair at the time was, um, I guess, just finished up an internship at Green Tech. So I came in guns blazing into Queens, looking to do everything and, and anything and thought, wow, this could be a good fit in terms of a company that focused on climate tech um, and finance. And they're mostly focused on M&A in that space. Um, but the first year me kind of forgot about it um, until the the end of second year, the mid second year when when we were applying the summer internship. So really the the prompt of going into banking at that time, to be frank, was I knew a lot of smart, nice, uh, sometimes not, not nice, but mostly nice and smart people were going into banking um, at my age. I respected those that were um, older than me that chose that career path um, initially. So I thought, okay, let's, let's give it a shot. And there's many other reasons that I probably actually told in an interview that I'm not sharing here, but the honest answer is I saw a ton of good people go towards that career path and said that my probably is a good one to choose for a summer internship. Um, so there, I focus mostly on M and A. Um, it's it's uh, boutique uh, M and A focused advisory uh, investment bank, um, and it was really interesting. It was sort of the early stages of the hype towards clean tech. So I got to experience sort of the the sort of new energy towards the space. Um, anything from how do we store energy from variable power generation to should we be focusing on EVs or should we be focusing on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to how do we make agriculture more sustainable? So it's a very confusing but exciting time. Um, but I, what I realized at that time is I love the space, but I was trying to answer the same question over and over again which was what is the st strategic reasons for a merger or an, an acquisition or a sale? And the second was how much should that be valued? Um, beyond that, there might've been some questions here and there that deviated from those two that make the, the job complex. So it's definitely not a, a simple walk in the park, but I thought the fundamental questions didn't change. At, at the end of the day, uh, discounted cash flow is a discounted cash flow. Uh, uh, merger uh, accretion dilution model is is going to be the same. Uh, uh, comps analysis fundamentally is, will not change. Um, there's going to be nuances around that, which make the job difficult. But I found myself answering and doing very similar things um, and just as an intern. But beyond that, asking those that have been there for three, four years, we're, we're sort of answering the same questions. So I said, what are what are some career paths which would 
let me answer different questions on a consistent basis. Um, I thought there are multiple different career paths that let you do that. I thought consulting was one that fit well. Um, and every project you're answering fundamentally different questions. Um, there could have been, pro so for example, my first project was how should we value uh, a dollar of rewards for a particular chain of gas stations? My second project was how do we negotiate the legal terms of a flight attendant contract after two airlines merged? And my third project was um, how do we restructure this business to focus on the most important business units? Very different questions, very different skill set used in those three projects. And that's kind of why I wanted to do consulting and, and happy it all worked out. Awesome. That's that's very interesting. So you so you essentially found that investment banking wasn't allowing you to um, in a sense work on the things that you wanted to work on and answer the larger scale questions and solve those problems than just, you know, simple, you know, modeling or let's say, you know, transactions. Would you say that's kind of the case? Yeah, I, I, I think you're spot on minus the simple. Uh, okay. yes, like these transactions are complex. They're, mm -hmm. they're fast paced. Um, they, there's a lot of skin in the game for um, uh, different parties, depending on where you, where you sit. I just thought, um, that is not the complexity that I particularly wanted on a day-to-day -day basis. I wanted complexity both in the work that I do, but the variety of work. And I thought consulting would would solve that. Yeah, no, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and just, I guess, one thing I wanted to, um, one thing I was curious about is um, during your time as investment banking analyst, especially, you know, working with these companies, you definitely got a ton of exposure and you got to see, you know, what these companies were working on. And so were there any specific insights or trends that, you know, during those early time periods, as you were just gaining some experience that really begin to form in your mind about, um, you know, sustainability, climate change, and some trends that you were beginning to see emerge that you believe that in consulting, you can make a bigger change on and, or let's say work on more specifically? Uh, that that's a that's a really good question. I think um, the the answer is yes, and then a bit of no. So on the on the no side, the one of the biggest trends that we kept on talking about and we tried to wrap our head around was energy storage. Um, you have variable wind and solar assets. The sun doesn't shine all day. Wind doesn't blow all day. How do you store that energy? That was like definitely in what was it 2014 13 um the biggest question in in the industry is costs are declining for solar costs are declining at for wind how do we actually store this energy to make the full um costs of of a per hour generation um in parity or below um one of a gas fire generator um energy storage was one of the key questions there but unfortunately i wasn't able to like fully use that in consulting because in, in consulting particularly at all of Wyman, you're working with these like pretty large corporates um who aren't as focused on or maybe their engineering side is but from like a business strategy perspective aren't as focused on those more nascent energy take uh, storage solutions. Um, so I knew it was a big trend. I just wasn't able to work on it in consulting. The flip side of that is during a time of green tech, another one was how do we decarbonize aviation? Um, and the big, uh, a big, one of the few solutions out there was sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and that I actually was able to use in consulting, working with uh, some of our larger airline clients on helping them understand the current cost profile of sustainable aviation fuel and where that can go in the future and, and some of the pros and cons of that. So that was maybe another one that I had a bit of background on going into consulting. I was actually able to, to use that to my advantage. 
Yeah. Yeah, that, that's really cool and interesting. And so, you know, kind of expanding on your time at Oliver Wyman, um, obviously it's a massive, massive consulting firm, uh, but w- what exactly was your role within the climate and sustainability department? So, like what, what did your kind of day-to-day responsibilities look like? And what, was, what were the kind of projects that you were working on and how were you making that change that you wanted to make? Yeah, um... Probably we'll answer that and then maybe uh, start to dive into why I sort of left. <laughs> um, the when when I started at Oliver Wyman, so maybe the first two ish years, um, very much uh, of the mindset of give me anything, I'll work on anything, I'll work in any location. Um, at that point, beggars can't be choosers. You just do whatever you're you're kind of told to do um regardless if that's in a location you want or a sector you want but then i think at around two years you're able to start to get what you really want whether that's you want to work with certain people or you want to work in a certain sector um i decided to want to do both <laughs> i had some really good people that that i really enjoyed working with um which was in the aviation space so i was flying to dallas and chicago like every week for for three years uh which took took a toll but it was fun um but at that time the group was trying to better understand the decarbonization of aviation as well so it was a topic that wasn't very big at all the at that time, but I tried to help push it. So it was pretty much side of the desk work outside of my day-to-day responsibilities, as you would typically see in consulting. Um, the outside of my work was very focused on research, uh, helping put together pitches, attending um, like conferences, online conferences and webinars and informing sort of our team on what the latest and greatest are and writing some articles and research reports on it. So very like business development focused, whereas my day-to-day role was very consulting focused, as you expect. Um, Typical breakdown of problem, try to solve it, um, analysis, presentations, stakeholder management, all all that. Um, It wasn't until my third year where it kind of third and a half year maybe where I kind of put my foot down and said, hey, I'm ready to um, fully focus on climate change if that's possible. And I want it not to be just business development focused. I want it to be sort of consulting type focused and start to do that. So I actually worked on a couple of projects here and there focused on climate change and decarbonization. Um, but I, what I realized in consulting was you are an advisor. Um, you are most of the time a trust advisor, uh, where people really need your opinion and want your opinion. But at the end of the day, you are an advisor. <laughs> if, if they want you there or if they don't want you there, you're an advisor and you're not responsible for what the company actually does and the decisions that they make. And in order to be in that position, you have to be an operator. So actually operating a company and making those decisions um, or an investor where you have a large um, shareholder position and, and board seats to actually drive that change. And that sort of was the genesis of going into more financial services. It's not that I didn't like the work in consulting. I just really wanted to drive change outside of, outside of an advisor role. It was very more, let's have skin in the game and let's actually make things happen. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And you, you mentioned that advisor aspect. So what does that actually look like? Were you... Um, what what, what were you really advising them on? Was it like, you know, implementing, let's say like ESG practices or, you know, changing things in their processes? What what exactly were you 
advising them on so that they could improve that sustainability climate side of things? Yeah, um, it's a it's a good question. So maybe, maybe I'll uh, focus on one example. Um, there, um, there was a project that we had with uh, a company in the transportation space, which really wanted to understand the investable opportunities in the space. It was a it was a corporate corporate client. Um, so think rail company, airline, um, auto manufacturer. And they were specifically interested among many other things on the opportunities within um, the energy transition. So what is our product line today and what should it look like based upon multiple factors and one of those factors being climate change. Um, so looking at what type of policies coming out, looking at the um, growth in ch or changes in consumer demands over time, and what is the products that might help fit that, and what are other competitors doing? So, very much like a market study, um, both on a qualitative level, but also trying to quantify that opportunity as well. So your your typical project um, that you would have in consulting, like what new market should we enter? Um, is probably a one-on-one case study or, or um, um, interview case, uh, but with an ESG and, and climate angle to it. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I'm 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 interested in you know, um, obviously in the last few years, especially maybe you know five seven years, there's been that big push towards companies adopting ESG practices and becoming more aware of really what's going on in the world and outlining, let's say, you know, future strategies, future plans of how they can be more sustainable and how um, they can overall contribute to the betterment of, let's say, the environment. So during your time at Oliver Wyman, when you were working with these companies, what kinds of systems were you seeing them implement that, you know, turned out to be maybe effective or maybe not effective um, in their strategy? Yeah, I I think there's probably uh, one belief I have on the ESG space that I think is very important for for you and, and your viewers. The notion there's this notion of ESG integration. And it's a buzzword that you'll hear multiple times, and there's the buzzword of sort of social impact investing. Um, on the ESG integration side, it's making sure your company or your shareholders, um, depending on what side you're in on, is fully aware of the impact you have on the environment and the impact the environment can have on you. That That's my view of ESG integration. It is more, let's preserve or grow shareholder value or returns by fully understanding your impact on the environment, your impact or the impact that the environment has on you, the impact on social considerations and how you're governing your, um, your company based upon those risks and opportunities. Um, so, that's ESG integration, which I think a lot of companies were starting to do. They were starting to report on their scope one, two, three emissions. They were starting to uh, report on diversity within the workplace. Um, they were reporting on workplace injuries. They were reporting on the governance structures and having the right people with the right expertise and having governance and board gender diversity. Those were all... I think to to put it in blunt terms, preserve and grow returns, but not to save the planet. So that's my view on ESG integration. The the view I think people have is strong ESG performers should be saving the planet, and I actually don't think that's true in my opinion. Strong ESG integration is to preserve shareholder and grow shareholder value. The 
impact investing side, um, I actually didn't see much of, but that was like another area of my interest. So impact investing is investing or activities for the purposes of bettering society and bettering the world. So you traditionally you have impact investing um, in like developing countries where you, you invest money and you 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 may have different type of shareholders with different return profiles, but at the end of the day, you're looking for social outcomes in addition to financial outcomes. Um, and then there's also sort of green financing as well. So you've probably heard of green bonds, um, uh, decarbonization funds. Those are focused on not only ESG integrations, so which you have, that's kind of table stakes. They're focused on bettering society and bettering the world. And I didn't see much of that going on in consulting, but I'm starting to see that more and more in, um, in, in my role today. So just wanted to make that distinction between ESG integration and, and sort of more um, impact investing. Yeah. Yeah. And on that impacting investing side, so, um, you know, now you're um, an associate at CPP Investments on the sustainable investing team. So when you guys are in evaluating these investments, what what's really the main factor that you're looking for? Is it like traditional investor, the traditional investor mindset of these big firms, which is what is going to give us the biggest return? Or is it more where, what, like, what impact will our money make? Will this money make the biggest impact? Or is it more about the return side of things? Or is it kind of hand in hand? It is, it is primarily returns. I, uh, our mandate as a fund, um, a legal mandate as a fund, um, is to maximize returns without undue risk or loss. Um, and we believe that ESG integration in that equation does help maximize returns and reduce risk. Uh, so our whenever we look at investments, um, whether that's climate-focused or ESG-focused investments, or non-ESG folks investments like a toll road or a port or um, a software provider, it's always from the lens of value creation and value, uh, shareholder value growth. Um, less so from the pure aspect of um, social impact. Now we do have an initiative net right now called Greater Green um, it is initiative to invest in companies and the economy and work with them to decarbonize. I wouldn't go as far as saying that's impact investing, but I will go as far as saying that is a method for us to maximize returns, but also to take emissions from some of the world's largest companies out of the economy. So probably not impact investing, um, but definitely goes beyond like ESG integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, earlier you were mentioning that one of the reasons you made that transition from consulting to this side of things was because now you could really drive that change and have some skin in the game. So what, is, how, how, what does that look like in your role? What are you actively doing day to day to, you know, drive that change? And what kind of, you know, let's say investments are you making that are you know, driving that change that you wanted to do? Yeah. Um, so maybe one angle that isn't associated with my group and then one angle that that is. So one angle that isn't associated with my group, within our sustainable energies group, we have um, um, this group called ITS. They focused on, I would say, early growth stage investments in clean tech. Um, so anything from energy storage to alternative proteins to um, uh, uh, new consumer software towards um, energy consumption. These are things that the team there views as some of the best opportunities in that space to maximize their returns, but also um, opportunities that will Fund that that are purpose to reduce global emissions. So, 
um, carbon capture is another one that 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 they look at. So that's that's one angle. Um, and that would be for that team your typical like identify opportunities, conduct an assessment of that opportunity, uh, look at other opportunities that might be similar to that. So a bit of a comparables analysis, and then a very bottoms up assessment on the potential financial returns of, of that that company. So very much uh, like your typical role as, as an investor. The other angle that we're playing on my team is on um, the asset management side. So maybe to give you like a view of the investment process. So you have sort of deal identification, you have um, sort of investment uh, decision making as like your first stage. Um, now you make the investment, and the second stage of the asset of the investment process is asset management, and that's where you can create a lot of value. And then the last stage is exit. At Queens and even myself, I always thought an investor role was very focused and only focused on that first part: identifying deals investing in deals and hoping for the best. Um, I was pleasantly surprised that that big chunk in the middle of value creation is very important and something that I just never really fully appreciated. And that's an area where my team focuses a lot of our time on, um, both from a risk and opportunity side. So we look at existing investments that are owned by let's say our infrastructure team, uh, let's say it's a toll road, and we work with them to help them identify climate risks and also opportunities that they can capture within that whole period to increase returns within that whole period and also increase that exit value once the team wants to sell out of that, that holding. So. Um, maybe just two areas of day-to-day of -day work there that um, might be helpful. And I'm happy to like go into maybe the, the details there if that's helpful, but uh, that's yeah, uh, yeah. maybe the overview. Yeah, for sure. Um, that, that's really interesting to hear. And um, I guess, you know, it's kind of sparking, a, 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 I'm sparking some curiosity in me. Um, yeah. So, you know, specific, going to the specifics of that, I guess. Um, so what's, what's the process of figuring out, you know, you mentioned the thing with the toll bridge and, you know, how to find opportunities to, um, you know, drive max maximize returns from that. So how do you go about figuring that out? Like what's, how do you go about figuring out the specific strategies that these teams can implement within what they've invested in to maximize returns? How do you just, you know, is it like, or do you spend a lot of time researching, um, talking to industry experts? How do you go about figuring that out even? Yeah, um, pretty pretty much exactly what you said. <laughs> uh, talking to industry experts, doing a ton of research, talking to management at these companies as well, understanding sort of that those trends. Uh, advisors are a big one. Talking to advisors as well, so consulting firms and 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 more specific research shops, understanding some of those trends and impacts and helping translate that to um, what is material for the deal and what can increase returns and or reduce risk for that deal. So it, in one scenario, it would be very easy for us to look at all the research out there and say, oh, we must do this and we must do that. And we here's a laundry list of things you, you now must do because we're a shareholder. But that's not very helpful um, for us or the management um, as well. What is helpful is if we do some of that research, help understand what are actually material to a company, or what actually could generate positive returns in the long term, identifying those, translating that into sort of investment speak, and also showcasing that value to management is um, areas that I think 
there's a lot of value where, where we add in that process. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. And going into detail, maybe a little more. So how do you figure out maybe what projects to win work on and which I know you mentioned about how you figure out, you know, what to do, but how do you figure out, you know, which projects or which investments to focus on to bring out results through that, you know, sustainability side of things? Yeah, there's, um, there's so many ways we, we go about it. Um, there's could be a lens of where, where is the largest, holdings and what is the risk profiles they face so if you have a 10 million dollar investment with a lot of or a lot of risk um but you have a five billion dollar investment with medium amount of risk um that medium amount of risk could actually have more value at risk compared to that 10 dollar 10 million dollar investment so there's like a bit of work there on, on what to focus on. But a lot of the work that we do is actually on new new opportunities. So as we look at new investment opportunities, looking at that not only from a fundamental basis on value drivers, um, but also from a fundamental basis of climate change, um, whether that's core to the investment thesis, so where whether that's you're investing in renewables in California, where like climate change is core to to why you would invest there um, or not um, versus where climate change has sort of this not primary, but maybe more secondary impact. So maybe like a uh, toll road, um, there's climate change impacts to it, but you're not investing per se in a toll road primarily for climate change reasons. Um, so considering that at the onset of, of new deals is, is something we look at from like an earlier stage. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, this is again, uh, um, this interview was meant to, you know, educate students, educate people interested about the industry, but I also have a lot of viewers who, um, you know, visit this channel to learn more about the stock market, about investing and about investment opportunities. So yeah. you have a wealth of experience a wealth of um, exposure that you've gotten or throughout the years working at these companies, seeing deals, seeing emerging trends and opportunities. So what industry specifically within the climate change or sustainability space are you personally watching, which you believe is could drive a lot of shareholder value and return in, let's say, the next 5, 10, 15 years? Yeah, um, probably in the short term, um, and then I'll maybe give an idea in the long term. In the short term, one thing that we're that pretty much every single company is trying to grapple with is um, what we call carbon accounting. Um, so, what are their emissions today? What are the sources? What what scope are they from? Where are they located? Um, how much of those emissions would be reduced by just like the grid, the power grid decarbonizing versus how many, how much of those emissions do we actually have to proactively reduce? Um, that whole notion of carbon accounting is, is super important, which dives into a bit of um, like the offsets market. Um, there's an, growing demand for high quality offsets, um, carbon offsets, which you could think of as like planting trees to investing in big technology um, or emerging technology. But the supply of those credits is quite low. So I think there's definitely sort of a short to medium term opportunity there. Long term, well, one thing I really want to watch is carbon capture. Um, and then also carbon capture storage and utilization. I think those are two areas that we're really counting on to reduce emissions from what we call hard to abate sectors. Um, so take an example of a cement manufacturer. Um, it'll be very difficult for them to decarbonize via different materials or different fuel types. But one of the right now relatively easier although very very difficult ways 
to decarbonize could be carbon capture. Very early stage technology, very difficult from a logistics and supply chain perspective, um, very expensive. So really hoping that takes off. Um, and then also the importance of that, of carbon capture is we, there's a lot of debate on like continued fossil fuel usage with carbon capture, which I can definitely have another podcast on that and debate that. But climate change for the earth is like a bat, bathtub that's overflowing, right? You not only need to turn off the tap for the water going into the bathtub, which what we're trying to do in your traditional, like replace coal with renewables and replace ice vehicles with EVs, that's turning off the bathtub, uh, the, the, sorry, the sort of the spout to, to put water in the bathtub. You also need, if you recall in the bathtubs, you have that little hole at the top. So in case it overflows, you have some water actually escaping automatically so that we don't overflow entirely and then we flood the bathroom. We need that little hole in the bathtub. And that might not be a little hole for climate change. It might be a massive gap. Um, we need that to make sure we, we stay under two degrees warming by the 21st century, or, or sorry, 2100. Uh, so I'm very optimistic and hopeful that that technology will grow because not only will it be beneficial for all industries, we, we almost are reaching a point where we, where we need it. So that those are, those are my short, medium and long-term views on investable opportunities. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And um, you mentioned the carbon capture and I believe I was reading actually the other day, something about how Bill Gates had invested in a company that was um, doing something like that. And definitely one thing I'm noticing with a lot of these, you know, companies is that right now they're, they're, they're just at the early stage, just getting kickstarted. So um, how important do you believe it is for these, you know, firms like CPP and other banks and their investing arms to really fund these projects? And when do you see that opportunity for the retail investors, like let's say you and me, to also begin playing a role in that and investing in these companies to help them fund that growth and that opportunity? Yeah, it's a, it's also a, a fascinating question um, because I, I might take it to a different angle than maybe you anticipate. So when I talked before about CPP maximizing returns without undue risk or loss, um, those investment opportunities could be there for CPP, but they might not reach the profile. I'm, I'm not saying they will not. I'm not saying they definitely do. I think you have to assess it on a case-by-case -case basis on what makes sense there. But I think the other area where I think many large institutions and retail or people like you and I that are starting to get involved in is the offset market. And now the obvious um, complaint to this statement is, well, I don't get money back. <laughs> it's not an investment opportunity. I'm just paying whatever, $50 per ton of CO2 and not getting that $50 back, which is a fair argument. But to get involved in those technologies in, at this stage as an individual or large corporates who are incentivized for these technologies to reduce in their cost, a lot of the offset market can help do that. So you're, you're seeing... Um, initiatives such as uh, Frontier, which have multiple different um, large corporations that are essentially um, sending a signal to technologies and companies that are developing these technologies that they will purchase these in the future at a certain price. And here's a ton of money to help you do so. There's, you mentioned Bill Gates. Bill Gates has a program called the Catalyst Program which essentially, I think they have a target of, I believe 10%, but don't quote me on that, on reducing the technology costs of a lot of these emerging technologies by 
putting in um, what they call catalytic capital, where you have you still may demand some returns, but you have different in type of investors within that pool who demand different type of returns to offset some of those lower returns expected in in these technology in certain emerging technologies. So that is another way on, on large corporates and investors getting involved in these more emerging technologies. So those are two ways. And then the third way is just investing in it um, as you would in a venture or growth stage fund um, where the investor sees that potential um, and thinks that they will generate strong returns over a five to 10 years. So those are probably the three areas that, that I would look at um, to actually get involved. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's really great to hear and a very insightful for sure. And I guess one one more thing that I was really curious about is if you believe that what's happening right now in the world is a turning point for renewable energy, because um, you know, I was reading an interview recently with Patrick Puyane, who I think I butchered his last name completely, who's the CEO of you know energy French giant Total Energies. And he was calling natural gas the transition fuel to renewable energy. But obviously, as we're seeing with the current climate in Europe, um, we're seeing how a lot of these countries have become over-reliant on Russia and on natural gas as an energy source and how there's currently a supply problem. So, And also, I was reading one of your Medium articles, and you highlighted how renewable sources are becoming increasingly cost-competitive. And their operating costs are more are highly predictable over time. So what do you make of the current situation? And do you believe that this could be a turning point in investments and, and adoption of renewable energy where countries and um, overall industries begin to look deeper into it as an opportunity? Yeah. Um, first off, I'll start by saying I think the situation like in Ukraine and Russia is very sad. Um, it's painful to watch, painful, painful to read about. Um, and unfortunately, it's caused also downstream impacts, whether that's food shortages, um, also tangentially impacted by climate change as well, causing food shortages on droughts from droughts. Um, and but as you as we've all seen at the gas pump increase in gas prices um, and and oil prices, um, the I originally when COVID hit, I said this is this is a massive opportunity. We all are working from home. We've all had a shock to the system. This is this is to take COVID as the sort of comparative example towards climate change, governments have to work together. Humans have to work together. We have to change our habits. We have to do like many of the parallels that you would think with climate change apply to what we would have had to do in COVID. Um, we've seen some of those collaborations, like we've seen some governments work together. We've seen many people change their habits. Um, we've seen corporates adapt. But not as to the extent of what I would thought would happen. Um, climate change, similarly, you, you need governments to work together. You need corporates to change. You need consumers to be more climate conscious. And there was all this notion of like build back better. And you're seeing maybe some benefits of that. Like the U.S. just passed a, a bill recently on this. Um, the EU is, is working on it, but, and you've had more countries coming out with climate commitments, but it's not to the pace that I would have expected or would have hoped for. Um, so that, that's sort of my view on, on COVID and climate in today's world. What's very different about this is one, if you read also my medium article, the, the, cost or price profile of like gas and oil is is a hedging opportunity um if there were companies that had strong alternatives to oil and gas as fuels this could save them a ton of money right now even 
my friend who owns a hybrid is laughing at me because I own a uh, ice car. So uh, he's like, I'm saving money and you're, you're still driving your, your same old car and, and gas prices are like 40% higher. So the problem with that is just the alternative, right? There's not a lot of strong alternatives to replace gas um, and oil, perhaps maybe in the power sector, but definitely not in, in heavy industry. So the cost pressures are going to flow through the economy. I just wish we had progressed enough on the technology change, whereas you could quickly shift towards alternative fuel types. So that, that's sort of my view, my view on the, the world today. Yeah, great, great insights. And um, I guess on, uh, for me, I, I really found this conversation um, extremely insightful and you provided a lot of great um, thoughts and shared some invaluable experiences that I'm, like I've definitely learned from. And I believe that a lot of people watching could learn from as well. So before we do wrap up, I was wondering if you had any other thoughts or, in, or parting thoughts or advice that you wanted to offer to the audience um, before we cap this off. Yeah, definitely. There's um, maybe I'll end off with some um, thoughts on sort of like where I might have been in, in your shoes and, and maybe your viewer's shoes in first or second year and, and where I am today. Um, take it for what it's worth. If it's helpful, great. If it's not, that that's fine. Um, the the there's sort of like three things I wish I knew in first or second year. Um, the first is it's very hard to pick one career path. Like my mind shifted from sales to accounting to marketing to consulting to finance. Like it was it is very difficult to be in your shoes and say, I definitely want to be an investment banker when I graduate. So if any of your viewers or yourself are feeling that you're behind because you have no idea what to do, but everyone else has figured it out, I will give you, I will put a lot of money to bet that most people have not figured it out including people my age and probably including myself. Um, so it's a continuous journey and, and, and don't be discouraged in, in that, in that stage because it's just normal. Um, the second is like, let's say you found your dream internship and you've found your dream role and you want to be the investment banker. Um, when you're doing that internship or you're doing that first year on the job, come more with questions and less answers. Like be curious, ask a lot of questions and be humble in terms of what you do and you don't know. Um, because I think it's important in those roles that people know you're curious and, and driven and, and all that. So come with questions on answers, um, but hopefully come with some answers um, along the way. And then the last is once you're in that full-time role and let's say you're a year in or two years in, um, work ethic will always win over potential luck or smarts. Um, those that are persistent, those that work hard, I've seen time and time again, be rewarded, may, may not be immediately, but in the long term. So definitely be persistent work outwork other people and, and you'll be you'll be fine awesome thanks for that and yeah i definitely agree with you like figuring figuring out what you want to do in your career is certainly a tricky thing but um that that's some great advice on on, on that side of things well shom it was great having you on really appreciate your gift of time you've provided some really invaluable insights to me and to all of us so uh, again, really appreciate it. And maybe one day again, we can have you on to discuss some more things. Yeah, definitely. Thank, thanks for having me. And uh, if anybody has questions about this yourself or your viewers, feel free to reach out via LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat about anything career, sustainability, life, Vancouver. Um, very, very happy to to be helpful in any way.